On the 28th of June, 1914, a Serbian nationalist in Bosnia assassinated the heir apparent to the thrones of Austria and Hungary. Suspecting the Serbian government of involvement in the assassination, Austrian officials demanded permission to investigate in Serbia. When rebuffed, they threatened to invade. Normally, Austria would never have actually followed through on this threat, as it would have triggered a defensive alliance between Serbia and the Russian Empire. But Emperor Wilhelm II of Germany stepped in and promised to back up Austria in any such war, the infamous blank check. However, Germany's invasion of Russia would have triggered yet another defensive alliance between Russia and France. But having seen Russia's failures in their war against Japan a decade earlier, Wilhelm and many German military leaders believed that they could take France out of the war by invading through neutral Belgium before Russia could even mobilize a credible defense. Having learned their own lessons from the war with Japan, the Russian army mobilized way faster than expected. And just like the Germans, they had a clear plan. Seize control over Galicia and East Prussia to avoid being outflanked before pushing straight on to the German capital, Berlin. By mid-September, they'd made serious progress toward this goal, but a combination of intercepted intel and supply issues turned the front into an inconclusive back and forth. Suddenly, in mid-1915, the Germans launched an offensive that resulted in the occupation of Poland, Lithuania, and Courland, effectively pushing Russia back to its pre-1797 borders. Though not obvious at the time, this offensive set Russia down the path of revolution and civil war. At this time, the Russian Empire was the most technologically, economically, and politically underdeveloped of the great powers. The rule of Emperor Nikolai II had only served to intensify the effects of that backwardness, and though far from the only example, the Emperor's policy towards Russia's Jewish population is a particularly extreme illustration. I've talked about this previously in these videos, but I'll try to summarize. In 1914, the Russian Empire had the largest Jewish population of any country on Earth. In fact, the largest Jewish population of any country ever. But that massive population existed at the very bottom of a century-old ethnic hierarchy that was already highly restrictive for most imperial subjects. Rather than living in what we would now consider Russia, the vast majority of Jews lived in the Pale of Settlement an area mostly comprising territories conquered from Poland and the Ottoman Empire in the 18th century. There were some small communities in Georgia and Azerbaijan, and certain Jewish families were granted the conditional privilege of living in Russia proper, but they were very much the exception, and it wasn't unheard of for these privileges to be revoked without notice. There were also strict rules regarding the place of Jews in civil and military life, which were frequently subject to change. But by this time, the most infamous fact of life for Jews in the Pale were the pogroms, locally organized riots against the Jewish population. While early pogroms had been geared towards terror and property damage, the riots became more and more deadly over the decades until mass murder became the main goal. When over 40 Jews were massacred in the city of Kishinev, it was an international outrage that seriously impacted global opinion and foreign policy regarding Russia. When Russia lost its 1904 war against Japan and a parliamentary revolution broke out, an association of Russian supremacist parties known as the Black Hundreds organized a campaign murdering 8,000 Jewish subjects in the course of 10 days. By this time, public opinion both domestically and abroad had firmly turned against the emperor, who had long since abandoned the illusion that his office was above politics. The revolution of 1905 had resulted in elections and a parliament called the Duma, but the emperor still retained enough power to render the Duma virtually powerless. He even repeatedly changed election laws so that the increasingly unpopular conservative and reactionary parties couldn't lose. With respect to the Jewish population, he even began openly identifying with the Black Hundreds, while the enmity between him and the general public became more and more hostile, narrowly avoiding a second revolution in 1913. To all of this, the response of an increasing number of the empire's Jews was simply to leave. Between 1881 and 1914, nearly two million Jews emigrated, mostly to the United States. Of those, more than half emigrated in the final nine years between the 1905 revolution and the outbreak of the First World War. 
The outbreak of a European war alleviated some of these domestic political tensions, as virtually every sector of the population rallied around the imperial banner. But not entirely, and not for very long. The failure of Russia's offensive strategy in Poland exposed the corruption and incompetence of Emperor Nikolai's hand-picked military authorities. Most notably, the Black Hundredist Vladimir Sokhomlinov, who was promptly removed and put on trial for treason. Just as that was happening, the Germans made their big breakthrough, as a result of which over a third of Russia's Jewish population now enjoyed more political freedom under enemy occupation than under their own national government. Russia's initial response to this was to ban Hebrew and Yiddish, declare Jewish civilians to be enemy agents, and expel them from what little of Lithuania and Courland remained under Russian control. But to where? The German advance hadn't stopped. And what was the point of deporting the Jews from these territories when an even larger number of them had already fled east with everyone else? So on the 19th of August, 1915, Interior Minister Nikolai Shcherbatov signed an emergency regulation opening the internal border crossings and allowing any and all Jewish subjects to take refuge outside the Pale, unofficially erasing it from existence. As the war progressed, so too did internal unrest, at virtually every level of society. Mass conscription had stripped the country of farm workers to harvest crops and railway workers to transport them. To an extent, this strain on labor and logistics was being felt by all the major players in the war, but it was especially difficult in Russia because its comparative lack of industry left it far more reliant on human labor. Where there was industry, strikes, which had plummeted with the war's outbreak, had by 1916 soared to new records. The emperor remained confident that his power would continue to go unchallenged as long as he enjoyed the confidence of the army. It was through them that he'd been able to retain effective power after the revolution of 1905 and suppress the strikes of 1913. To that end, he assumed the role of commander-in-chief in September 1915. It's truly difficult to overstate the degree to which this backfired. With Nikolai taking a lead role in the war, his regular duties shifted more and more to his unpopular German-born wife Alexandra and their truly hated spiritual advisor Grigory Rasputin. Meanwhile, assuming command of the army also meant that Nikolai would be held responsible for any future success or failure on the battlefield, and it was mostly failure. In the summer of 1916, Russia launched the Brusilov Offensive, which resulted in a small advance into Austrian territory and convinced Romania to enter the war as Russia's ally. But it had come at an enormous human cost, which arguably left Russia in a worse strategic position than before. Romania's entry into the war also proved a liability as, by the end of the year, most of that country had fallen to the enemy. By the winter of 1917, every major city in Russia was in a state of famine, and January alone had seen 751 new labor strikes. Rasputin had been assassinated in December by some extended members of the imperial family. But Interior Minister Alexander Protopopov seemed intent on continuing his influence from beyond the grave, allegedly even holding seances for the purpose. Public outrage had reached a tipping point. The revolution which Nikolai had narrowly avoided before the war finally arrived. On the 7th of March, still February under the Julian calendar still used in Russia, Nikolai departed Petrograd in order to take charge on the battlefront. The city had been renamed from St. Petersburg in a feeble attempt to distance the imperial family from their ties to Germany. Already, workers had gone on strike at the massive Putilov factory. But with the emperor's departure, virtually all industry in the capital ground to a halt. The following day, International Women's Day, workers took to the streets demanding bread. By the 9th, the crowd had grown to 200,000, now demanding not only bread, but the abolition of the monarchy. On the 11th, soldiers dispatched by the emperor to suppress the protests quickly joined them. Nikolai was finally losing the army. Oblivious to the severity of the crisis, the emperor responded to calls for help by ordering the dissolution of the Duma, which, powerless as it may have been, voted to ignore him. The next day, Russia's various socialist parties re-established the Petrograd Soviet, a local workers' council which had briefly existed after the ill-fated 1905 revolution and would soon replace the Duma as Russia's primary legislative body. A week into what was already being called the February Revolution, 
Nikolai finally gave in to pressure from his military advisors and abdicated the throne on behalf of himself and his son Alexei in favor of his brother, Grand Duke Mikhail. However, Mikhail rejected the offer pending approval by the forthcoming government. That approval never came, ending the Russian monarchy forever. Unable to secure asylum from any country due to their extreme unpopularity, the former emperor and his family would spend the rest of their lives as prisoners. That same day, a coalition of liberals in the Duma reached an agreement with the Petrograd Soviet to form a provisional government under Prince Georgi Lvov. Immediately, the provisional government issued a decree announcing new elections, amnesty for all political and religious dissidents, and universal citizenship for imperial subjects through the abolition of all social, ethnic, and religious discrimination. Six days later, the new provisional government was formalized with the aforementioned rights, and on the 2nd of April, the Pale of Settlement was officially abolished. Jews had been emancipated in Russia. At this point, it's probably a good idea to look at the Jewish political landscape in the former Russian Empire. Those who are new to this channel may be surprised to learn that Jewish politicians weren't unheard of even before emancipation. After the 1905 revolution, Jews were allowed to vote in elections to the Duma provided that they met the same property and standing-based requirements as everyone else, even though they weren't technically citizens. In fact, no fewer than 13 Jews were elected to the Duma in 1906. Most of these came from the Constitutional Democrats, or Cadets, a liberal party which was initially the largest faction. Though by this time the most popular party, both among Russia's Jews and the population overall, had become the Socialist Revolutionaries, or SRs. But there were also several niche parties that specifically focused on Jewish issues and ideologies. By far the largest of these was the General Jewish Labor Bund, a movement dating back to the 1890s which combined Marxism with autonomism, a kind of Jewish tribal sovereignty in the areas of education and culture. Ironically, the original founders of the Bund weren't able to enjoy the new developments in Russia. Chief organizer Arkady Kramer had fled to Paris in 1912 and was now unable to return, while the Bund's main philosopher Vladimir Medem had stayed behind when Vilna fell and became a German collaborator, working with the German-Jewish politician Ludwig Haas to establish an autonomous Jewish school system in the newly formed puppet kingdom of Poland. The February Revolution quickly produced a rival to the Bund in the United Jewish Socialist Workers' Party, or Vereinigte, which was pretty similar to the Bund, except that most of its members weren't Marxists, and it actually supported a much broader form of Jewish autonomy than the Bund did. Both of these parties had a political alliance with the SRs. Paul Etzion, led by the US-based Berberochov, had formed in the early 1900s after the Bund expelled its Zionist faction. By this point, they were by far the largest Zionist political party, in Russia and everywhere else. They were traditionally allied with the Mensheviks, the less authoritarian offshoot of the former Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, which was itself led by the Jewish Yuli Martov. In addition to these three were a handful of very small non-socialist Jewish parties, autonomists, religious liberals, ultra-orthodox, and even a Jewish reactionary party, most of these were in a loose alliance with the cadets. Jewish politicians were divided on how best to engage with their new civil rights. Cadet Maxim Vinaver actually cautioned against an influx of Jews running for office, lest it provoke a public backlash. But no sooner had he made his feelings known than he and three other Jewish liberals were appointed to the governing Senate, the Russian equivalent of the House of Lords. Similarly, between March and November, no fewer than 11 Jewish politicians served at some point on the executive committee of the Petrograd Soviet. While it had succeeded in the removal of the Romanov dynasty, the February Revolution had done little to resolve Russia's various crises. Because it had emerged from the questionably democratic Duma, the partisan composition of the provisional government skewed far to the right of the electorate. From their shared headquarters at the Taurida Palace, the Petrograd Soviet applied increasing pressure to include more leftists, and over the spring, Minister Chairman Georgi Lvov gradually handed leadership duties over to Soviet Vice Chairman Alexander Kerensky. Kerensky was a fairly safe choice. He'd held office in both the Soviet and the Duma, and had been part of the provisional government from the very start as Minister of Justice. But even his leadership over the new Russia would be short-lived. <laughs> 
By this point in the war, Germany had experienced many of the same problems that Russia had. As a much more industrialized society, Germany was far more capable of handling those problems, but that was little comfort to Germans experiencing food shortages, unusually cold weather, and extremely high war casualties with no end in sight. By the spring of 1917, Germany had effectively become a military dictatorship under Chief of Staff Paul von Hindenburg and First Quartermaster General Erich Ludendorff. And they had an idea. See, during the early phases of the war, the Allied powers had experienced a series of uprisings across their large empires, so Hindenburg and Ludendorff developed plans to sponsor new uprisings in order to pull resources away from the war in Europe. Surprisingly, these efforts proved totally unsuccessful. With one exception. For over a decade, Switzerland had been home to an assortment of Russian political exiles, mostly socialists. And for the past year, that had included Vladimir Lenin and his Bolsheviks, the more authoritarian counterpart to Yuli Martov's Mensheviks. Throughout the war, Lenin had watched in horror as most socialist parties in Europe had rallied around their national flags in support of the conflict, including those now active in Russia. Sensing an opportunity to exploit the most prominent Russian voice for peace for their own advantage, the German government in April 1917 made arrangements to transport Lenin and his immediate associates on a sealed train to Petrograd by way of Scandinavia, soon followed by several hundred exiles from various other socialist movements. Lenin arrived in Petrograd to ecstatic crowds, and the following month was joined by Leon Trotsky, a charismatic former Menshevik newly returned from exile in the United States. But it was unclear where to go from there. As strange as it may sound, most people in Russia still supported the war, but the tide would soon turn in the Bolsheviks' favor. At the year's beginning, Russia had agreed with the Western Allies to launch a new offensive against Austria-Hungary in the spring. That had been postponed indefinitely due to the February Revolution, but since then, support for the war had begun to erode in the Petrograd Soviet, and newly appointed Minister of War Alexander Kerensky was eager to head off the Bolsheviks by showing that Russia was still in the fight. Kerensky himself even toured the front lines, giving patriotic speeches in support of the offensive. And when it launched in early July, Russian shock troops were able to create an opening pushing the Austrians back. But these gains were short-lived, as German reinforcements not only repelled the attack, but nearly pushed the Russians out of Galicia entirely. It would be the last Russian offensive of the First World War. Back in Petrograd, the Bolsheviks, anarchists, and the more left-leaning SRs broke out in a violent uprising. Kerensky and the provisional government responded brutally ordering troops to fire on demonstrators and having Trotsky and other Bolshevik leaders arrested while Lenin fled to a newly independent Finland. It was at this point that Kerensky fully took control as minister-president, appointing General Lav Kornilov as commander-in-chief of the army. Kornilov believed that the failure of the Galician offensive had resulted from the Petrograd Soviet's establishment of soldiers' councils, intended to encourage collective military decision-making and give soldiers the same rights as workers. So in September, Kornilov organized a coup attempt intended to eliminate the Soviet. Desperate, Kerensky freed Trotsky and other Bolshevik leaders, brought them back into the Soviet, and armed them for the purpose of fending off Kornilov's coup. Their efforts succeeded, and on the 14th of September, Kerensky officially declared the formation of the Russian Republic. But his days were numbered. The failure of his offensive in Galicia, the constant changes in government, and ever-growing war weariness were bringing more and more Russian citizens to the side of the Bolsheviks, nowhere more so than within the army itself. From his new position as chairman of the Petrograd Soviet, Trotsky successfully maneuvered the Bolsheviks into a dominant position in the chamber, arranged for Lenin's return to Petrograd, and, with Lenin, pushed the Bolsheviks to support the overthrow of the provisional government. Now, until now, I've avoided talking about the Bolsheviks' relationship with the Jewish population, and there's a reason why. They didn't really have one. Among the various socialist parties, the Bolsheviks were notable for their relative lack of Jewish support, having historically alienated the community due to their extremist rhetoric and laissez-faire approach to systemic anti-Semitism. That isn't to say that they were short on high-profile Jewish figures. Indeed, their preponderance of Jewish leaders was just as notable as their paucity of Jewish followers. But those Jews who had aligned themselves with the Bolsheviks tended to be assimilationists from uncommonly privileged backgrounds, 
Trotsky was the most infamous example of this, the son of a wealthy landowner who spoke Russian as his first language in a time and place when vanishingly few Jews could own land or speak Russian. Indeed, it wasn't unheard of for the Bolsheviks to use anti-Semitism as a campaign tool. As Kerensky declined in popularity, the reactionary anti-Semitic newspaper Groza began to spread rumors that he was Jewish while praising the Bolsheviks as defenders of Russian racial supremacy. In preparation for the upcoming elections, some Bolshevik campaigners in Moscow even advertised themselves as the party of anti-Semitism. And on the 6th of November, as Kerensky left the Winter Palace for what turned out to be the last time, he chanced upon a piece of graffiti that read, Down with the Jew Kerensky! Long live Trotsky! The next day, the Bolsheviks seized power. The implications of this weren't immediately clear. The Bolshevik takeover had been long anticipated and occurred with little fanfare. Officially speaking, this was still the Russian Republic. Elections for the new Constituent Assembly were still scheduled for later that month, and the Bolsheviks had merely taken over until then. This was the first election in Russian history in which all adult citizens had the right to vote and had an equal vote. And unlike in previous elections, deputies would be elected by party list proportional representation, which is to say that the number of deputies elected from each party was determined by that party's share of the overall popular vote in each governorate of the republic. However, elections couldn't be held everywhere. The regions under German occupation were ruled out from the start, but even much of Central Asia and Siberia were unable to participate. And in several areas, total vote counts were never completed. As a result, nobody is quite sure how many deputies were actually elected. What I'm about to show you is just the best estimate I could come up with. What is certain is that the Bolsheviks didn't win. As usual, they had failed to consider how much of the population still lived on farms. And as a result, the SRs continued to dominate. So when the Constituent Assembly convened in January 1918, Lenin and the Bolsheviks simply shut it down and began ruling Russia as a single-party state. The Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic. While all of this had been going on in Petrograd, events had unfolded very differently down in Kiev. Ukraine had had an exceptionally active political scene before the war and was ready to seize the initiative as soon as the emperor abdicated. Being far more organized than the provisional government, they successfully negotiated for the creation of an autonomous Ukraine all the way back in June, later transitioning to full independence in response to the Bolsheviks as the Ukrainian People's Republic. Ukraine also had an enormous Jewish population, nearly 2 million, and all of those Jewish parties that had been active at a national level enjoyed even greater prominence there. When Moshe Rafis took charge as leader of the Bund, he mostly did so from Ukraine's central legislature, the Rada. These Jewish parties had been enthusiastic supporters of an autonomous Ukraine, which quickly established Yiddish as a co-official language and a dedicated ministry of Jewish affairs, with similar ministries for ethnic Russians and Poles. Seemingly out of nowhere, Bundism had been achieved. And it immediately ran into problems. In keeping with the principles of the Bund and the Ukrainian revolutionaries generally, the Ministry of Jewish Affairs was fairly limited in its scope. But because of Ukrainian Jews' inexperience living in a democracy, the ministry was often called upon to intercede with the Ukrainian government in ways that had nothing to do with its official purpose and were fundamentally unnecessary in a representative system. With the Jewish parties already divided over how much power the ministry should have, their improvised role as communal intercessors only fueled more infighting, which proved disastrous when pogroms began to break out near the lines of battle. Immediately after the October Revolution, the Bolsheviks declared a unilateral ceasefire with the Central Powers, with the intention of negotiating a permanent peace that would allow the new Soviet government to hold on to its existing territory. However, as any such agreement would take months to negotiate, the Russian army began to fall apart. Almost all penniless, and often drunk, deserting soldiers quickly began targeting Jewish, Polish, and Mennonite communities near the front in search of food, money, and women. With most young men in these communities still serving on the front lines themselves, the local Jewish self-defense committees which had taken action against previous pogroms were virtually non-existent, making these communities especially vulnerable. 
Speaking out against the pogroms, Ukrainian Minister of War Simon Petliora met with Jewish party leaders. A veteran of the Russo-Japanese War and Gallipoli, Yosef Trumpeldor had come to Kiev in June, helping to establish the Zionist-aligned Jewish military union. Likewise, Ber Borochov had returned from the United States to serve as leader of Paul Etzion in Ukraine. They agreed with Petliora that a dedicated Jewish defense force was necessary to suppress the pogroms, but their proposal was vehemently opposed by the Bundists and Vereinigte on the basis that such a force was anti-egalitarian and would only encourage further sectarian violence. On the 15th of December, the Bolsheviks signed an armistice with the Central Powers, and more soldiers began attacking Jewish communities. Two days later, Borochov died of pneumonia. He was buried just outside Kiev in a massive complex of Jewish cemeteries known as Babin Yar. Soon after, his successor Yaakov Zerubavel led a far-left faction of Poelezion in defecting to the Bolsheviks. Finally, on the 28th of January, the Ministry of Jewish Affairs caved to public pressure and agreed to sanction a dedicated Jewish self-defense. But it was too late. By this time, the Red Army had taken Kiev. Under occupation, Jewish publications still operating in the city spoke out against the Bolshevik invaders, who retaliated by committing pogroms of their own. Having signed an armistice with the Central Powers, Lenin and Trotsky immediately began stalling peace negotiations, in the incorrect belief that Germany and Austria-Hungary were just weeks away from their own socialist revolutions that would enable the Bolsheviks to regroup their military force and hold on to their existing territory in the West. Instead, the opposite happened. In February, the Central Powers broke the armistice and continued their advance eastward, facing ever more pressure from the Petrograd Soviet to sign the shameful peace and save the world revolution. Lenin signed the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, ceding Ukraine, Belarus, the Baltics, and part of Armenia, the wealthiest, most industrialized, and most populous parts of the former empire. Initially, the influx of German occupation forces enabled the UPR to recapture most of its territory, but they wouldn't last much longer. Now that Germany didn't need to fight Russia, any pretense of supporting Ukrainian nationhood became irrelevant to their main goal of seizing as much Ukrainian wheat as possible to feed the war machine in the West. In most of the German-occupied territories, this could simply be accomplished by allying with local landlords. But unlike those territories, Ukraine had an actual quasi-independent government run by socialists who'd already begun collectivizing former aristocratic estates. So on the 28th of April, the German military sponsored a coup by dispossessed aristocrats to shut down the Rada, establish a quasi-monarchy known as the Hetmanate, and subject Ukraine's farms to the direct supervision of the Central Powers. Jewish autonomy was abolished, and in the event that Ukrainian peasants resisted handing over their meager crops, German and Austrian authorities quickly made a habit of issuing proclamations denying that this was happening and instead blaming the Jews. By October, they'd even begun to blame Jews for spreading rumors in a feeble attempt to deny the impending German defeat in the West. These deflections had little effect on Ukrainian antipathy towards the German occupation, but their long-term effects would soon become clear. Now, ever since the Bolsheviks seized power, Russia had been slowly devolving into civil war. While the Red Army had quickly asserted its authority over most Russian territory, various groups from the army and the provisional government had been consolidating their own power on the frontiers. As early as December, most of the cadets had fled south and east in the hope of getting help from the Allies, often joining up with dissident military leaders to form the White Faction. The Mensheviks, which by this time were dominated by Georgians, seized power in Tbilisi as the Transcaucasian Federative Democratic Republic. Interestingly, the Mensheviks' former leader Yuli Martov sided with the Reds, as did a large number of SRs and anarchists hoping to serve as a viable opposition movement in the new Soviet Russia. But the real civil war began in May 1918. See, back when the war had begun, the Russian Empire had created a legion made up of Czech and Slovak dissidents to fight against their native Austria-Hungary for the creation of an independent Czechoslovakia. With Russia's exit from the war, the Bolsheviks, now renamed the Russian Communist Party, agreed to aid the Czechoslovak Legion in their redeployment to the Western Front by going the long way around, across Siberia and North America. But the evacuation was waylaid by negotiations and occasional mutinies. 
Finally, on the 25th, the legions seized control of the Trans-Siberian Railway and the White Armies sprang into action, quickly aided by the Western Allies in the hope of bringing Russia back into the Great War. By early November, this civil war seemed to reach a stalemate. But then something very unexpected happened. The First World War ended. On the 11th of November 1918, Germany became the last of the Central Powers to sign an armistice with the Allies, ending the Great War. Within two days, the Soviet government repudiated the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk and immediately began mobilizing to take back as much former territory in the West as possible. But this would prove harder than expected. On the 16th, former UPR leaders Volodymyr Vinichenko and Simon Petliora reconvened the Central Rada, mobilized the remnant Ukrainian army, and by mid-December had re-established the Ukrainian People's Republic. As chairman of the ruling directory, Vinichenko restored the policy of Jewish autonomy while declining to do so for Russians and Poles, feeling that only the Jewish parties in Kyiv had proven their loyalty to the UPR. As it turned out, this sentiment wasn't shared by a large minority of Ukrainian soldiers and local militias. The persistent accusations against Jews by the German army, though ineffective at deflecting criticism of the occupation, had apparently taken root as had the numerous communist military victories under Trotsky in his new role as Minister of Defense. Some members of the directory, notably the hardline nationalist and eventual turncoat Oponis Andrievsky, actively exploited widespread ignorance of communism to promote the idea that it was in fact a capitalist and Jewish supremacist movement, leading pogroms to break out as soon as the UPR retook Kyiv. Keenly aware of this problem, Ukraine's top general Petliura attempted to maneuver his troops in a manner that would avoid Jewish communities as much as possible. In his pre-revolutionary career as a journalist, he'd spoken out eloquently against anti-Semitism, and during the UPR's first incarnation, he'd attempted to work with Jewish leaders in the fight against pogroms. Now he composed a series of memoranda calling for a halt to the violence, but the reach of his authority was severely limited. By this point, the Ukrainian army was mostly composed of self-organized militias who didn't answer to the directory, and even many of the regulars were either loyal to Andrievsky or simply ignored Petliora's orders. In one especially brutal instance, an obscure young general named Ivan Semesenko, suffering from severe late-stage syphilis, ordered his men to celebrate the defeat of a Bolshevik uprising in the city of Proskurov by massacring 1,650 of the city's Jews and wounding a thousand others over just three and a half hours. After holding the city as his personal fiefdom for two more weeks, he was recalled and eventually executed for insubordination. Petliora was hesitant to take more decisive action for fear that it would only weaken the UPR further and ensure its fall to the Bolsheviks. Unfortunately, that ended up happening anyway. Even before the Proskurov pogrom, the Red Army had retaken Kiev. Rapidly losing faith in a Ukrainian state that couldn't protect them, Moisha Rafis led factions of the Bund and Ferenikta in defecting to the communists, arguing that only the Red Army could re-establish law and order, and only working within the communist system could save the promise of Jewish autonomy. The communists, in turn, capitalized on this through an aggressive propaganda campaign demonizing the UPR and especially Petliora as bloodthirsty anti-Semites, and offering Jewish defectors a putative means of revenge through service in the Red Army or in the new secret police force known as the Cheka. It was for exactly this purpose that they'd already established the Jewish Commissariat, or Evcom, and the Jewish section of the Communist Party, or Yevsektia, dedicated to publishing Yiddish-language propaganda welcoming groups like Rafis' defectors into the fold, and weaponizing them against Jewish groups designated as enemies. This had been a long time coming. Several months earlier, the Jewish head of the Leningrad Cheka had been assassinated by a disgruntled army officer on the very same day that a Jewish SR in Moscow had attempted to assassinate Lenin. This eventually turned out to be a coincidence, but the fact that one of the perpetrators and one of the victims had been Jewish initially raised suspicions that the attacks had been jointly orchestrated by an unknown group of Jewish dissidents. So, as the Soviet government initiated its Red Terror, Evcom chief Semyon Dimanstein led his own campaign to liquidate Jewish cadets, SRs, Zionists, and any remaining Jewish communal institutions be they religious, political, or merely practical. 
Eventually, the Soviet executive committee stepped in and declared that Zionism wasn't counter-revolutionary, within certain boundaries, but that didn't stop de Manstein from mounting a personal vendetta against the pro-communist faction of Poelezion. It was exactly for this purpose that he'd welcomed the ex-Bundist Moshe Rafis. But any hope Rafis might have had for Jewish autonomy was gone. He would spend the rest of his life as a loyal communist. And despite his newfound faith in the Red Army, the pogroms of 1919 were far from over. The anti-Bolshevik white movement was never unified. Even leaving aside its vast political spectrum, ranging from more moderate SRs to ex-Black Hundreds, the speed with which the Bolsheviks had seized control over most of European Russia had scattered the whites to the fringes of the former empire, splitting them into three main groups. The provisional All-Russian government in Siberia, led by Admiral Alexander Kolchak, the Northwestern Army in the Baltics, led by General Nikolai Yudenich, and the Volunteer Army in southern Russia, led by the disgraced General Lav Kornilov. From the outset of the Bolshevik takeover, Kornilov had promised nothing less than a return to the political order established in the February Revolution, with all the freedoms therein. And as the only force that seemed capable of resisting the highly organized and efficient Red Army, a great many Jewish cadets, right SRs, and otherwise liberals from across the empire arrived in the South to offer their support. The sincerity of Kornilov's promises was questionable at best, but it hardly mattered as he was killed very early in the Civil War. His replacement, General Anton Denikin, was a sincere liberal, and his views toward the Jewish community reflected that. Raised in Poland, Denikin had more direct experience with Jewish life in the empire than most elite officers, and during his service in the Imperial Army, he'd been quick to defend the honor of Jewish and Jewish-born soldiers against fellow officers who dismissed their contributions on principle. However, this sentiment was shared by almost none of his subordinates. Back in early 1918, cadet politicians in Crimea had established an anti-Bolshevik provisional government which included a large number of Jewish officials, including Maxim Vinaver as foreign minister and native son Solomon Krum as prime minister. For most of 1918, the Crimean government acted in close concert with the Volunteer Army, and in the hope of further integrating their efforts, Denikin's second-in-command issued a proactive statement to his troops in Crimea forbidding any racist incitement. But in an astonishing act of insubordination, the volunteer commander in Crimea rejected not only the order, but the entire principle of cooperation with the Crimean government on the grounds that it included Jewish and socialist politicians, and thus should be treated as an enemy no matter what. This was a fairly common sentiment, and one which found new life in the early months of the Civil War. In July 1918, the former imperial family had been held prisoner in the city of Yekaterinburg, which was then under threat of capture by the Czechoslovak Legion. Panicking that the Romanov family would be rescued and used as poster children to undermine the legitimacy of the new Soviet government, President Yakov Sverdlov ordered the summary execution of Nikolai, Alexandra, their children, and what remained of their imperial entourage. That President Sverdlov was Jewish only fueled blood libels by Orthodox priests and other ex-Black Hundreds who found it convenient as a recruiting tool. By June 1919, when the Volunteer Army began its invasion of Ukraine, new Jewish recruits were flatly rejected, while active Jewish soldiers and officers were systematically demoted or discharged. The volunteer propaganda office known as Osvag was purged of most of its Jews and anyone suspected of Jewish ancestry under the pretense of rooting out Bolshevik saboteurs, afterward publishing increasingly explicit media lauding the White Army as a Christian force in a holy war against the godless Jews, Latvians, and Chinese, with Trotsky as the Antichrist. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, a previously obscure work by the Black Hundredist Pavel Khrushchevan, was republished under multiple names and became a bestseller among the ranks of the White Armies. A resurgence of pogroms in Ukraine followed the White advance, taking on an increasingly elaborate, sadistic character reminiscent of those committed by the Black Hundreds 14 years earlier, and which I won't describe in detail for the sake of time, monetization, and my sanity. I'll just say this. You know that trope from silent movies of the villain tying a woman to the railroad tracks? That kind of became their trademark. Unlike the Ukrainians, the white forces were being directly supported by the Allied powers, 
who were increasingly reluctant to keep supporting an organization that seemed more interested in killing Jews than in actually fighting the war. When British correspondent John Ernest Hodgson questioned white officers on the rationality of their obsessive anti-Semitism, they accused him of being Jewish, and even claimed that U.S. President Woodrow Wilson and British Prime Minister David Lloyd George were Jews themselves for daring to question their methods. Like Petliora, General Denikin disapproved of the growing violence, and at times took action to shut down explicitly black hundredist media outlets. But unlike Petliora, he had far more power to put a stop to the pogroms and made even less effort to do so, only speaking out after the worst of the violence had already subsided. In 1928, using information collected during the Civil War by Jewish organizations, local governments, and the Red Cross, sociologist Nahum Gergel was able to account for 1,182 pogroms in which 30,922 Jews were murdered. However, subsequent analysis of demographic data from the period suggests that Gergel's count was an underestimate, that the number of pogroms was closer to 1,500 and the death toll at least 50,000. According to Gergel's admittedly flawed assessment, the armies of the Ukrainian People's Republic and their affiliated militias were responsible for 37% of pogroms, 26% of pogroms were committed by unaffiliated bandits, gangsters, and other opportunists. The white armies committed 18% of pogroms, while the red army committed 9%. 4% of pogroms were committed by the army of Nikifor Khrihoriv, a rogue general who fought for the UPR, the reds, and the whites, and thus defies categorization. 3% of pogroms were committed by unidentified perpetrators, and this is also the case for pogroms committed by the Polish army. One group that notably doesn't appear in Gergel's statistics is the anti-Bolshevik left, or green armies a coalition of anarchists, left SRs, and peasant militias who'd initially sided with the Red Army before later turning against them. But as I said, these statistics are incomplete. In fact, the anarchists took credit for one pogrom and are suspected of involvement in at least one other. Every side had Jewish soldiers, and every side killed Jewish civilians. Anglo-Jewish playwright Israel Zangwill put it better than I ever could. It is as Bolsheviks that the Jews of South Russia have been massacred by the armies of Petlura, though the armies of Sokolo have massacred them as partisans of Petlura, the armies of Makino as bourgeois capitalists, the armies of Hyorev as communists, and the armies of Denikin at once as Bolsheviks, capitalists and Ukrainian nationalists. It is Aesop's old fable. During the height of the pogroms, the Red Army mounted a huge offensive to push the provisional all-Russian government back to the Ural Mountains. In desperation, Admiral Kolchak handed leadership of the White Movement over to Denikin and led his forces in a grueling winter retreat across Siberia, only to be captured by a rival faction and handed over to the Red Army to be executed. In the west, Denikin fled the country, and what remained of the Whites organized a mass evacuation from Crimea. In the years to come, the Red Army would still have to contend with Japanese occupation in the Far East, a Polish invasion in the West, and a prolonged anarchist insurgency. But as far as most people were concerned, the Russian Civil War was over. In 1914, the Russian Empire had been home to nearly 7 million Jews, the largest Jewish population of any country ever. By 1920, a combination of combat fatalities, pogroms, territorial losses, mass emigration, and the concurrent Spanish flu pandemic had cut that number nearly in half. And despite fulfilling the long-awaited promise of emancipation, that number would only continue to shrink. Emerging from the chaos into a Soviet Russia, Jews enjoyed equal citizenship, freedom of movement, and an end to the killing. But to what purpose? Cities were in ruin. Homelessness was rampant. The currency-based economy was suspended, making life virtually impossible for the small trades and crafts on which Jewish communities were especially reliant. And not everything could be excused by the needs of the war. Jewish institutions of almost all stripes had been shuttered. The independent Jewish press had been liquidated. Tens of thousands of Jews labeled counter-revolutionaries had fled the country never to return. Bundism in Russia had been eradicated, the teaching of Hebrew outlawed. Only Zionism remained in the form of Poaletzion left 
though much diminished under constant surveillance and not for much longer. And in many cases, their most enthusiastic oppressors were fellow Jews. When the February Revolution of 1917 brought the promise of emancipation, the Jews of the former empire had no idea of the catastrophe that lay ahead of them. They still had no idea. Special thanks to my patrons, including Mir Akbar Ali, Jeremy Biskin, Boris Cherney, F.C., Matthew Feinberg, Jay Fleischman, Osha Gordon, Bob Huddy, Raphael Kellerman, Sol Cohn, Jacob Kossoff, Eric Lederman, and Jeffrey Schweitzer.